Well, good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to you on this Sunday morning. As most of you are aware by now, our pastor, the Reverend Robbie Hall, is now with his Lord. What a week of contrasts this has been for us here at Hope Baptist Church, Bridgend. You know, we have spent many hours delighting in happy memories of Robbie's ministry with us. His generous heart, his drive, his confidence in his Lord. Such memories have unashamedly and not unsurprisingly caused our tears to fall like rain. But we will forever honour Robbie's calling and ministry. Now, his funeral will take place here at Hope on Wednesday next, November the 18th at 11 o'clock here at Hope Baptist Church. And it will be followed by a service at Lalliston Cemetery at 12.30, at 12.30. Now, regrettably and solely due to COVID-19 restrictions, both services will be private and by invitation only. At the graveside too, we are limited in numbers, but I believe it is possible perhaps for a few members to come and stand quite far back. That is something that I must tell you, but discretion should be used naturally. Now then, thankfully, we are going to be able to stream this service on uh, YouTube. Um, you'll be able to see it. And we trust that everything will go according to our plans because this is new territory for us. And we thank God for it. Also online, there will be a book of condolence available. And we will give you further details about that online. Once all the COVID restrictions are lifted and we are able to worship together in our church quite freely, not having to worry about numbers at all, then Hope will give a big Thanksgiving service for the life and the ministry of the Reverend Robbie Hall, who of course was Colonel Hall, QGM. Queen's Gallantry Medal, and we're as proud of that part of his life as so many, many, many are. Now, a servant of his Lord and a born leader, it was of no surprise that Robbie, upon retirement, would seek to enter the ministry and pastor his own church. In humility, Colonel Robbie Hall, with all his master's degrees, sought training at South Wales Baptist College, where he wanted to prepare himself for ministry. He was tutored and mentored by the staff of the college. And by the Reverend Dr. Ed Kaneen, who is now the dual principal of that college. Now it soon became evident that the teacher-pupil relationship would deepen into a very wonderful God-blessed friendship. Both had a passion, one church, one faith, one Lord. It will be Ed who will be conducting the funeral at Robbie's request. But there is more. Out of a very busy week, 
Reverend Dr. Ed Kaneen, will be taking our service for us this morning, and he will giving will be giving us the sermon. Do you know our gratitude to him is immense for taking us into this new path that lies before us. Our prayers reach out to you, Ed, personally and for the work of the college in these unprecedented times. Thank you for coming. And now we join together as God's family and start this service this morning. Thank you. morning. Shall we all pray together? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you this morning as your children. We thank you that you love and care for each one of us. Your word tells us how great is the love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. As our Father, you know and understand how we feel, and you know that our hearts are heavy at the moment because we are grieving the loss of our dear pastor, Robbie Hall. We want to thank you this morning for his life and witness and for every memory we have of him. Thank you that his love for you shone through everything he did and that he was so faithful in speaking to everyone he met about Jesus. You know how much we will miss him, but we are comforted by our sure and certain hope in the resurrection. We know that Robbie is with the Lord he loved and served, and that we will meet him again. We pray for Helen and his family. We ask that your love and grace will surround them, and that they will know the peace and comfort only you can give. We pray that you will bless us as a church. Sometimes we find it hard to understand which way to turn or how to go forward, but we believe that as for God, his way is perfect. Your word tells us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, 
Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So although we don't always understand, we trust you. We pray that you will lead us forward to be a witness for Jesus to the people of Bridgend. We think this morning of those of our fellowship who are ill, those who are lonely, anxious or depressed, those who have problems and difficulties known only to you. In a moment of quietness, we lift each one up to you now and pray that you will be to them all that they need. We pray for our country during the, this pandemic. We ask that you will bless NHS workers, those caring in nursing homes and in the community, and all those who are working selflessly to keep us safe and well. We pray for our government and ask that you will give our leaders wisdom to make the right decisions and a willingness to turn to you for help. We pray for those whose lives have been devastated by the pandemic, those who have lost loved ones and those who have lost their jobs and businesses and who are desperately worried about the future. We pray for agencies seeking to help and support people at this time. In particular, we pray for the work of the food bank. We pray that the work going on to enable the food bank to move to hope will be blessed by you so that we may be able to show the love of Jesus in a practical way. We think this morning of our world, so much sadness, pain and despair. We pray for agencies such as Christian Aid and BMS World Mission, seeking to bring help to people affected by war and natural disaster. We pray for the Myanmar refugees in camps in Bangladesh, those in war-torn Syria, Yemen and South Sudan. We think of the situation in America the oppression in China and unrest in Hong Kong. We could go on and on. We pray that you will look down in mercy and bring the leaders of this world to see their need of you and seek your face. We pray for our link missionaries, the Douglas family in Nepal, the Darby family in Uganda, Andrea and Mark Hodgkin in Chad, and Jane Edwards serving in Mozambique. Bless the practical work they do in your name. And through that, may they have opportunities to share your gospel with those they seek to help. Encourage them, keep them safe and bless their families, we pray. So, Lord, we ask a blessing for ourselves this morning. We ask you to bless our families, some of whom we haven't been able to see in person for such a long time. Watch over and bless them, we pray, while we are absent one from another. We entrust them to your loving care and keeping. We pray that you will speak to each one of us this morning from your word. You know our hearts. May we each hear your voice this morning, be ready to obey and serve you as your people in our community. We ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Good morning. The reading is taken from Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25. New heavens and a new earth. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. 
I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it any infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labour in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And now, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will with, be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Borada, good morning. My name is Ed Kaneen and I'm co-principal of South Wales Baptist College in Cardiff and for a number of years I was pastoral tutor to one Robbie Hall. Over these last few months Robbie and I have spoken regularly. My phone has even put him at the, the top of the screen alongside my wife and the co-principal of the college with me. And I feel desperately sad that I won't receive a text or a phone call from him again. And so I'm glad to be with you today because we are united in that grief, united in that aching loss that leaves us feeling hollow, empty and bewildered. We've lost a pastor, a mentor, a friend. And for Helen and the boys and the rest of the family, of course, they've lost so much more. And we can't help asking, why, Lord? Why does it happen now when everything is going so well? We can't help asking why, even though we know that no answer will really satisfy. But this is not a funeral, and this is not a funeral sermon. For just as we are united in grief, so we are united with Robbie in our Christian faith. Over the last few months, Robbie and I have spoken of many things, but most often we spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Robbie's death, just as his life, is a witness to the love and the grace of God in Jesus. And this morning, though we have every reason to feel like giving up, I want to speak about hope. And I should say that if it was ever up to me to name a church, I think I would go for hope. Because 
It's at the heart of what God would speak to our hearts in the spirit of Jesus. The trouble is that today we're not really together, are we? If we were, we'd tell stories, we would laugh as well as cry, we would sing hymns that would encourage us and stir us, we'd hug each other and by that means we'd find some hope together. I'm really sorry that at the moment that is just not possible. But instead, we take refuge in God's word and we find our hope in God's truth. So let us pray. O oh God, we thank you that you are our help and our strength in the most challenging of times. This is one of those times, O oh God, and so we pray, draw close to us by your Spirit, that you might stir hope within us, even if it's as small as a mustard seed, that it might grow and develop, that as we encourage one another, so we would find renewed faith and trust in our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our reading comes from the first letter to the Thessalonians, and you can imagine what it must have been like. Thessalonica was one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire. It's the second largest city in Greece today. The Apostle Paul had come and preached there, explaining from the scriptures that Jesus had to die and rise again. And some of the Jews, they accepted the message, as did some of the Gentile women and men. And they would have formed a church, a gathering of believers in Jesus, where they worshipped and they learned about the faith from Paul and they encouraged each other to witness to the good news of new life in Christ. It was all going so well. And then Paul left, going on to other places as a missionary. And then the small group of believers started to face persecution. Maybe it started as name-calling. Perhaps they stopped being invited to important gatherings and meals. Perhaps they lost friends, family, jobs. Almost certainly, they started to face violence because they were Christians. And then some of those first believers who came to faith alongside them, well, they died. And perhaps it was because of old age or illness, but it's also possible that it was because they were killed for being Christians. And so you can completely understand this group of believers in Thessalonica being bewildered, because believing in Jesus, that's great. Experiencing the forgiveness and the new life of the Spirit, that's fantastic. Worshipping together with like-minded people and sharing your life together with brothers and sisters, that's wonderful. But being abandoned by your pastor, facing persecution for your faith, seeing beloved brothers and sisters dying when you'd been promised eternal life, I mean, surely that wasn't part of the plan. Perhaps, like me today, you're saying, God, what are you doing? Everything was going so well, and now this. And that, of course, is against the backdrop of a global pandemic that has affected us all. And you may know people who've lost their jobs, who've been separated from family, who've been struggling with mental health, or perhaps even people who have died. And then, of course, there's whatever you're facing in your life. Those things that you never imagined would turn out the way that they have. You know, it just doesn't seem to have been part of God's plan. God, what are you doing? Paul is so worried about the situation in Thessalonica that although he has gone on to Athens, he sends his co-worker Timothy all the way back to Thessalonica to find out how they're doing. And Timothy, he goes back to Thessalonica, and then he comes all the way back to Paul in Athens, and he reports what he has seen and heard. And in light of that report, Paul writes this, 1 Thessalonians, the very first piece of Christian literature that we have. And what does he say? Well, in chapter 3, verse 6, he says, Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. Well, thank God for that. They continue to believe in Jesus. They continue to love each other. That's what it means to be a Christian, doesn't it? 
but there's something missing. At the start of this letter, Paul speaks about faith and love and hope. And then at the end of this letter, Paul again speaks about faith and love and hope. But here in the report on the current situation of those believers, because of the situation they are facing, they've got faith, they've got love, but they're missing hope. And I want to suggest that we need these three things to live as Christians in these times. We need faith more and more, yes we do, and we need love more and more. But if that's all that we have, then like a three-legged stool that's missing a leg, we'll soon fall over, because we also need hope more and more. And so Paul says to them in our reading in chapter 4, verse 13, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. The only way in which we can face the pain that we're all feeling now is with the hope that is offered to us in the Gospel of Jesus. A few years ago, we were driving down the M4 and we we overtook a lorry. And it was a lorry that said on the side of it, Hope Construction Materials. And I thought, wow, uh, we've got to get a photo of this. But we'd already gone past. So I was slowing down in the middle lane and I don't know what the cars behind were thinking. And I'd managed to get my phone out of my pocket and I'd thrown it to my daughter in the back. And I would said, take a photo, take a photo. And she was saying, slow down, slow down. No, no, go faster, go faster, go faster. I don't know what the lorry driver imagined was happening in the car next to him. But eventually we managed to get this photo. And I love it because... It seems to me that it represents that idea that our faith gives us the resources to construct hope. And so what are the materials that we're starting with? Well, Paul would have drawn on his Jewish tradition. Uh, the words of scripture from the Old Testament, because throughout the Old Testament, the Bible as a whole, we have visions of hope, promises of hope. And our reading from Isaiah chapter 65 verses 17 and following is just one example of that. And I'd really encourage you to read it and to meditate upon the amazing words. But please notice this. The Bible doesn't pretend that everything is fine. There's no, oh, how are you? Oh, wonderful. When really we're not. No, in that passage, it talks about weeping and mourning. It talks about the death of young children. It talks about those who die seemingly before their time. And the Apostle Paul, perhaps thinking of words like this, talks about death as being the final enemy. And though we're often thankful that suffering is over and we're really thankful that Robbie's suffering didn't last longer than it did. Well, let's not pretend that death is something good. It's not God's way. It's not God's purpose for humankind. And so when we feel that gut-wrenching anger or sense of just such sadness in the face of death, well, it's a reminder that we've been made in God's image and we share something of God's feeling about death. And the Thessalonians knew that, which is why they were so troubled. But what is the picture that Isaiah offers of God's future? Well, no more, it says, shall there be the sound of weeping or the cry of distress. No more shall there be an infant that lives but a few days or an older person who doesn't live out a lifetime. No more. Instead, it offers to us descriptions that thrill the heart and fire the imagination. And we know that these are only word pictures. They're the people inspired by God trying to express in words and images that which cannot really be expressed. But still, they're wonderful. Isaiah 65 tells us that God's future will come to pass when the pain and the hurt and the heartache will have no need to be remembered. 
It will be a time of gladness, of delight, of joy. Life will abound, fruitfulness will be everywhere. People will have homes and livelihoods and productive jobs. Their relationship with God will be so close, so intimate. And creation itself will be reordered around the practice of peace. Verse 25, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. That is so beautiful. And this is God's purpose, God's plan, God's design for the future in which we put our hope. But do you know when it was that they shared these images, these stories, these visions with each other? Well, it wasn't when everything was going well. In fact, this prophecy in Isaiah, it was offered when they were in exile, under the hand of the oppressors in Babylon. When everything that seemed to be permanent and secure in their world had been destroyed. When what they had believed to be fundamentally true seemed to have been disproved when they'd lost all that was precious and could see no future for their people or their race, indeed when God himself seemed to have abandoned them, that's when they told these stories. That's when they offered each other these visions. Because it's when we can't see the way ahead that we need somebody to point actually that's the way forward. And this was a vision of hope in the midst of despair. For the time when we need hope is not when everything's going fine. It's when everything has gone wrong. When we've been reminded that control of our lives is actually not in our hands. And it's beyond our power to build heaven on earth. And it's this vision of hope that lies behind Paul's words in this letter to the church in Thessalonica. That the problems of the present, of pain, of suffering, of loss, they're not all there is or all there ever will be, even if it feels like that right now. Instead, hope reorientates us to be future focused. If the words of scripture provide the construction materials for Paul's hope and ours, well, what is it that brings it all together? I mean, I know that Robbie, as you probably know, could turn his hand to anything, to plumbing, to building, to woodworking, you name it. And uh, if you've ever been into Helen and his home, you'll have seen some of the things that he has made. Amazing. But we're not all like that. And if I receive some flat pack furniture, well, I may be able to lay out the different bits, but there's no guarantee that it will end up looking like the picture on the front of the box. So what is the the glue, if you like, that holds together the different construction materials of hope that were given in Scripture? Well, as far as Paul is concerned, it's simply this. And he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. It's not hard to believe in the death of Jesus. We will all die. But the Christian believes that Jesus conquered death. The grave couldn't hold him. And because Jesus has defeated death, therefore, those who have died in him will also live with him forever. Benjamin Franklin famously said, In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. I think Paul would say, For those in Christ, nothing can be said to be certain except death and resurrection. You see, it's Jesus' resurrection as the firstborn from among the dead that provides the glue and the guarantee that all the hope construction materials in the Bible, they will come to pass. Because if the greatest and final enemy, death, has been defeated by Christ, then we can trust him for all the rest. The promise of God is for all who believe. As Paul says here, we will be with the Lord forever. Hallelujah. But then he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Our Christian hope, our firm belief 
is that Robbie will be with the Lord he loves forever. I know he would not have chosen to have died and left you at this time, of course not. But he died as he lived, bearing witness to the hope that we have in Jesus. We need hope today. But so does our world. In these uncertain times, I believe that we have a responsibility as God's people to live as people of hope, as beacons of hope in our families, our communities, our workplaces. Because what do we have to offer the world? It's not the grim predictions that everything is only going to get worse. We can get that anywhere. You just have to switch on the news. No, what we have to offer the world is the promise of hope because we believe in the one who died and rose again. You've perhaps heard the phrase, oh, that's so-and-so, they're a real no-hoper. Actually, one of the ways in which Paul describes the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is, we are hopers. And hope is not just a passive agreement to a set of beliefs Actually, it's something that transforms our thinking and our actions. We live in hope. It's our identity. It's part of the Christian's DNA. And so on this day, amidst our sadness, our grief, our confusion, our questions, our bewilderment and our fears, let us remember who we are. We are hopers because of Christ. Would you put your faith in Jesus today? For Christ holds out to you the offer of forgiveness and salvation. Will you commit to continuing to love one another? For Christ has shown us what love is through his death for us on the cross. And will you hold on to hope? Even if you can only grasp it with the slightest of grasps. Because believe me, hope will hold on to you. Because our hope is in Jesus Christ, risen and reigning forevermore. As the scriptures say, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as I pray now, I know that the whole church in South Wales and beyond is praying for these beloved people today. Indeed, the Lord Jesus himself intercedes for us. And we cry out in our pain, our sadness and our loss for that glimpse of hope that will lift our eyes from the very real troubles of these times to the promise of what is yet to come. We thank you so much for our pastor, Robbie, who has proclaimed Christ, who's loved his people and who has witnessed faithfully to the gospel. We thank you for each story that we remember and for the example that he has left with each one of us. But we know that this is not the end. But he passes on to us the flame of the gospel that we might live in faith and love and hope until that day when we too will be with the Lord forever. So in these days, grant us patience with ourselves and one another. The peace that passes understanding in our hearts and the promise of life on our lips. It may be that as you think of Robbie's example, you want to share in the hope that he had. And if that's you today, perhaps you'd like to pray with me, either out loud or in your own heart, just repeating my words to God. Lord Jesus Christ. You know me, you know my situation. You know that I have not always gone your way or done what was right. I've often lived as if you didn't exist or didn't matter. But today... I want that same hope for the future that Robbie had. 
Jesus, I believe you died and rose again. I turn to you and put my trust in you. Please give to me your Holy Spirit today. that he might be my guide and my comfort for the days ahead. Amen. Well, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe the hundredth time, but it's meant something fresh to you, I know that the church would want to help you and love you and support you in your journey with Jesus. And please do get in touch with them if you're not already by Facebook or by other means. Nearly a hundred years ago, Thomas Chisholm wrote the poem that has become a popular hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, which contains the line, Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. That describes it so well. We need strength for today, there's no doubt. But we have received many blessings, not least our relationship with Robbie. And so we also have hope for tomorrow. And all the good things that we experience are the little foretaste of that hope that is yet to be revealed. So let's listen to this hymn or perhaps sing it with gusto depending on where you are. But know that there is hope for you in Jesus.
Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, especially when this is that most difficult of days for us all, but it's been good to worship together. The psalmist writes, We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us all and all those we love, and all those for whom we pray now and evermore. Amen. We have been blessed this morning as we have approached the throne of God. We know that he understands all about us, all that we are feeling right now. And to be joined together is such a blessing, such an encouragement. And again, I thank Ed Kaneen for coming to us and upholding us in this way. So now let us all pray. Let us bring our prayers to God at the end of this service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Bible, our Bible, the book, your book, your story, your plan, and all that it encompasses for our life in the days ahead. Heavenly Father, we bring to you these verses. When Jesus had led them out into the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then, the disciples worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Dear Father, what Jesus did, Robbie did. What Jesus said, Robbie said. And what blessing Jesus gave, Robbie still gives us today. We beseech you, Father, may we follow and stay continually at our house of prayer, our spiritual home here at Hope, praising only thee and being one church, one faith, one Lord. Amen. Besides you I desire Though my heart and flesh become weak You're my strength, the portion of my life For I know that my Redeemer lives in all control Within his hands, though my heart may fail and my flesh pass away, with these eyes I will behold the Lord. Lord, create a clean heart in me and let all. Trials I am grieved Let my faith, Lord, be proved genuine For I know That my 
my Redeemer lives and all control is within His hands. Though my heart may fail and my flesh pass away, with these eyes I will be. Trials seem too difficult for me. Let your grace be my sufficiency. Of you I've heard by the hearing of the ear, but your face is what I long to see. For I know that my redeemer. Pass away with these eyes, I will be hold For I know that my Redeemer lives, and all control is within His hands. Though my heart may fail, and my flesh pass away. I will